Thank you, Michael. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that it's my pleasure to be here today. It, first time to this big and nice, uh, nice room. Um, so I will present you what we are doing and what we have done inside the uh, uh, EZIT uh, BFC uh, project, uh, building the basic blocks for programmable matter. So the agenda of the presentation will be the following. First, I will present you our vision about programmable matter, and then we'll switch to the hardware design, software, and then some, uh, some results. So first of all, what do, we, uh, uh, what do we expect about programmable matter? It's uh, this kind of application that is maybe a bit more futuristic than what we are doing currently. The idea is to create objects that are autonomous and interactive such that constructing this kind of, uh, of object. During this, uh, this project, we, are, we have worked with a PSA group, and uh, the idea was to uh, try to set up uh, a pre preliminary version of uh, interactive uh, CAD uh, program. So for example, you have uh, an engineer that is designing a rear view, you can see it on the screen. And then uh, this representation of the rear view is uh, transferred directly into the, the matter, which is composed of micro robots uh, that you can see here, the, the big uh, spherical robot that are on the, on the screen. Then the designers modify the shape uh, to, uh, to fit their, their needs. And this is automatically uh, uh, downloaded to the engineer uh, desktop, which can perform some uh, calculation, mechanical resistance, etc. So the idea is to have a, a design cycle uh, which would be uh, faster for uh, many kinds of uh, professions. So to do this, we have uh, gathered uh, a consortium uh, that groups some uh, teams in computer science from, uh, from France, but also from, uh, from abroad. Uh, in microelectromechanical systems, electrical engineering, uh, mechanical engineering with uh, the CNRS in, um, in Poland, uh, artists too, and then, uh, of course, uh, industrial partners, uh, three from France and one from the, the US. Um, all together, it's about uh, 40 people that are working on this, uh, on this project, both permanent and non-permanent staff. So how do we uh, plan to, uh, to build these robots? Uh, everything began in 2006 at uh, Carnegie Mellon University with a uh, meter scale uh, helium balloon uh, actuated by electrostatic forces then to decimeter, centimeter, and then millimeter at 2011. Uh, it's uh, at that time that I joined uh, Carnegie Mellon University as a visiting professor, and uh, I took the lead on the, on the project with the, the objective of building the next generation of robots, including um, a processing unit, uh, which this one has not, and also being able to move in 3D. So not only a cylinder, but rather kind of quasi-spherical uh, element, which is presented here. Um, we plan to build it in 2020, but it will wait for 2021. <laughs> Due to the pandemic, we had some problems as many parts are coming from, uh, from abroad. And uh, the next step would be to, to think about a flexible uh, uh, robot. So how, how it is done? Um, uh, we are uh, using a, a sheet of uh, polyamide uh, substrate, which is conductive and, uh, and flexible. We laser cut it. Then we uh, texture uh, the electrodes on top of the polyamide. We put the processing unit on one half of the shell and uh, the power driver on the other half. And then we close down the, uh, the robot. So what's the progress of all of this? Uh, we, uh, we have already some, uh, uh, some shells printed by a nanoscribe printer. Um, and uh, the, the shape that you can see here is not a trivial shape. It took us uh, some time to, uh, to come up uh, with it. 
It's a very complex uh, object. And uh, why is it so? Because uh, we are using um, electrostatic forces. You can see the, the electrodes on the, on the left. And electrostatic forces are uh, decreasing by the square of the distance. So we have to keep the, the electrodes as close as possible uh, from, uh, from, from both electrodes. So the, the first version of the, the electrodes are um, only sticking, and the second version will also allow uh, rotation. Um, the problem of electrostatic forces and uh, CPU is that they are using uh, quite different voltages. Uh, for CPU, it's like 3 volts. And for the uh, electrostatic electrodes, it's between 100 and 200 volts. So we need to upscale the, the voltage. And here you can see a, a picture of uh, one attempt to build uh, this such a kind of driver. So here it's PV cells that are put in series. And you can see LEDs on the back of the, of the processing unit, which uh, allows for transmission of uh, light and voltage upscaling at the same time. Um, we, we tried also some, uh, some actuation uh, using the, 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 the scale of the, of the robot and uh, electrostatic forces. And uh, the first conclusion was that it's possible to, to move such kind of, uh, of object. Uh, regarding the, the processing units, we are using the M-Cube, Michigan Micromote. It's a millimeter it's a cubic millimeter generic sensing platform. And what is practical for us is that it's composed of different kinds of layers. So we can add or remove layers uh, as we want. And it's, uh, it's what we are doing currently. Uh, we design a new kind of, uh, um, of processing unit with uh, Michigan University to fit exactly our needs. Um, now the, the software part. So first, uh, the simulator that we have built. Visible Sim is an open source behavioral simulator for lattice-based modular robots executing distributed algorithms. It is developed by Femto ST Institute. It performs a deterministic simulation of systems composed of similar robots in different flavors of 2D or 3D lattices. Visible Sim is used by many roboticists and computer science researchers and is available on GitHub. Several kinds of robots can be simulated, and Visible Sim is designed to easily add new robotic architectures. Smart blocks are moving in a 2D square lattice, sliding along each other, whereas hexanodes turn around a neighbor in a 2D horizontal hexagonal lattice and 2D catoms in a 2D vertical hexagonal lattice. Blinky blocks are a bit different, as they do not move, but can glow in different colors. Real hardware blinky blocks have been fabricated and they are fully operational. Simulations made in Visible Sim have been compared to executions on real hardware and have shown the high precision of Visible Sim for distributed algorithms, synchronization time, and mechanical resistance evaluation. 3D catoms and datoms are our latest development of hardware. They operate within the same lattice, but their modes of movements differ. To test the performance of Visible Sim, we have designed a stress test experiment consisting in simulating a sort of concurrent Brownian motion over as many modules as possible within a square grid. At the start, a single leader module activates and sends an activation message to all its neighbors. Upon reception of this activation message, modules turn into the activated state. Activated modules then alternate between a 0.5 second wait and a random motion lasting one second. When a motion ends, the moving module sends an activation message to its new neighbors, if any, before starting the next wait move cycle. The simulation ends when all modules are in the activated state. Visible Sim has been able to simulate up to 32 millions of robots, which is the highest number of moving robots ever been simulated. This sets a new record. Visible Sim can help any researcher to develop, test and debug distributed algorithms for modular robots. 
It also offers a powerful visualization tool for effectively communicating research results. Okay, um, so that's the, the, the simulation environment, but what, are, what is the, the model that we are using currently with the, our robot? So each robot executes a program as an ID, a processing unit, memory, communicates with the, its neighbors, and is placed on a regular lattice, lattice and it, of course it can move. So what is the, the difficulty? If this circle is a, is a robot, then uh, two robots connected by their electrodes have a physical and a network connection, and they create a, a graph. So uh, all the, the computing uh, elements are based on graph uh, uh, paradigm. The problem is that here, if you want to find the center, for example, it's very easy because you have the global view of the graph, but each robot has only a partial view. So that's the main difficulty of this field of, uh, of research. Um, the major algorithms are self-assembly and self-reconfiguration, meaning to assemble a shape or to reconfigure a shape. And uh, until now, all the examples of uh, reconfiguration, either developed by us or by uh, other uh, universities are taking lots of time. You can see here it's like 12 hours. So until now, changing the shape of an object uh, meaning was, uh, was meaning taking a lot of time. So what we try to, uh, to do during, uh, during the, this uh, project is to decrease this time. So we used three techniques, having a kind of reserve of module underneath, uh, scaffolding, so constructing objects using scaffolds, and coating to uh, finally render the, the, the object. And that creates fast, efficient, and high fidelity self-reconfiguration. Of course, there are multi-agent uh, strategy for each robot, and they are all communicating with each other. And finally, the, the results. Uh, given the rotation time that we uh, measure, and using the, the simulator, we, uh, we found out that we needed six seconds to reconfigure 1,000 uh, robots, approximately, which is completely changing the way we can now uh, envision uh, self-reconfiguration. So I think it's the major result uh, of, uh, of this project. Uh, we have some others. For example, we have created a, an art uh, exhibition at Centre Pompidou Experimenta and uh, Studio 105, which uh, has been seen by uh, approximately 20,000 visitors. We have uh, a patent uh, and, uh, of course, our simulator. And we have uh, published uh, in the most well-known uh, venue, for example, Hamas, for computer science. Okay, so now I think it's time to finish and I'm uh, available for questions if you have any. Thank you. I will take time for one question. Thank you, Julien. Very nice talk. Um, I, I was a question about the, the connection between the robots. Uh, as far as I understand, it's, it's a nearest neighbor connection. Are there people thinking about uh, long distance connection, maybe to anticipate the movements or things like that? In fact, we, uh, we already studied uh, uh, long distance communication, uh, but th the nice thing with uh, this short range communication is that it gives us two information. We are latched and uh, we can communicate with uh, our neighbors. When you are doing uh, wireless communication, for example, you don't have this topological information, and this is crucial for 
determining the shape of the, of the robot. Thank you. So I think that you, you, you may ask your question during the break after, because we have to save time. So thank you again uh, for yeah. your very funny talk. And I brought some uh, samples of uh, the different parts of the robot if you want to, to see them during the break. Thank you.